Hello, in this lecture, which is part of a series on MRI pulse sequences for neuroimaging research, we'll be talking about artifacts as image distortions and what to do about them. We'll be covering a number of different artifacts, such as aliasing, magnetic field inhomogeneities, which can cause either warping or signal loss, ghosting, motion, artifacts related to the radio frequency pulse or RF pulse, which could be fat suppression, overranging, or spiking, and finally looking at some effects of physiology, specifically the heartbeat and respiration. The first artifact we talked about a little bit in the lecture on K-space, and that is if you look at this image on the left, you will notice it's a sagittal picture of a person's brain, but you notice the front of the uh, person's face sort of appearing where the back of the brain is supposed to be and the back of the brain appearing where the front of the head is supposed to be, sort of overlapping that. And the reason for that is that the field of view has shrunk uh, smaller than the object that we're imaging. Now what happens is that we're still acquiring all of the data. We're still sending in the radio frequency pulse into the whole head and acquiring the data with the RF coil from the whole head. And so what happens uh, with the signal that's outside the field of view, if you look at what that actually means in K-space when we're acquiring it, it means we're acquiring the data points further apart in K-space. And the fact that there is actually a signal outside the field of view means there's information in between these points in K-space that we're not adequately sampling. So we're not sampling fast enough in K-space, and that results in aliasing, that is the image being wrapped around. Now there's a couple of solutions to fix this. One simple one would be simply to increase the field of view. However, if we wanted to keep that field of view but eliminate these uh, aliased uh, parts of the image, an additional possibility would be to apply some radio frequency or RF saturation bands. That we, we send in a signal at first to excite just these uh, parts of the, uh, what we're imaging in this case, the parts of the head outside the field of view, apply some crusher gradients to get rid of that signal, and then a short time later after that, you know, that signal, that part of the image, that part of the brain really shouldn't be providing any more signal, and then we can start our normal acquisitions. And because those have been uh, saturated, we're not going to see signals from that. Another distortion uh, comes from non-uniformities in the magnetic field. So if we place the head in a magnetic field, uh, the magnetic field is going to become distorted somewhat. So on the left is a simulation for what the magnetic field distortions would look like uh, with the uh, main magnetic field going in the up, look, down, sort of superior, inferior direction. And on the right is an actual image of a field map uh, taken from Larry Wald at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And what you notice is the um, non-uniformity, particularly here in the um, frontal lobe, as you can see also here in this image of the brain, and that results from this air tissue interface in the sinuses. Because of this difference in magnetic susceptibility between the air in the sinuses and between the tissue in the brain, uh, that causes magnetic field non-uniformities uh, that propagate even further into the brain. Now, what consequences does that have? Well, first of all, stepping back, uh, these magnetic field changes uh, can be either macroscopic, as I was discussing in my previous slide, but there can also be microscopic magnetic field and homogeneities that we're actually interested in. In this case, for example, looking at the small gradients and non-uniformities in the magnetic field around red blood cells or around vessels due to the oxygenation of the blood. So in particular for functional MRI, we often want to be sensitive to these kinds of changes. And one way to do that is to have a longer echo time. Uh, but unfortunately, if we're sensitive to these microscopic magnetic field and homogeneities, we're also much more sensitive to these macroscopic magnetic field and homogeneities, which, as you'll see in the following slide, can cause some distortions in the images. So in-plane magnetic field changes, that is, distortions that are in the in-plane direction, will cause the image to be warped. And that's kind of illustrated here in this axial slice of the brain or here in these coronal slices of the brain. Here's another example of that in a phantom. This is basically a cylinder of water where there's a grid inside of it and that's supposed to be perfectly rectangular. And if we apply a bit of distortion in the magnetic field, we, the field is warped and you can see that the image is shifted. And in particular, it's shifted in the phase encoding direction. And that is because this is the uh, um, direction, and this was acquired using an echo planar imaging sequence. And this is the direction that is the slowest. Uh, so that gives more time for phase errors to accumulate. Now, phase 
in one space, in K space, is equivalent to a shift in the other space, in this case, the image space. Now, one way we can fix that, well, first we can do what's called shimming. That is, we can try to um, make the magnetic field as uniform as possible using additional what are called shim coils. And that's a typical routine actually done before acquiring any uh, functional MRI data or particularly EPI data. Um, however, there's only so much we can correct for uh, using these shimming procedures. One way we can correct for that as well as do through post-processing, uh, that is we can use a B field or magnetic field map to unwarp the images. Uh, so that's what's shown here for that grid phantom at the bottom. Uh, on the left, I'm showing you a magnetic field map that was acquired. Um, and if we had a map of the magnetic field, we can use that to undistort or correct the image. Now, one way we can collect this field map is by collecting two images at a slightly different echo time. Now, if you remember, the change in the phase over that change in echo time, d phi dt, is omega frequency, which we know is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. So by looking at these two images and finding out the additional phase that has been accumulated by this additional bit of echo time, we can get an image of the magnetic field. Through plane magnetic field changes, that is magnetic field variations that are in a through slice direction, will cause signal loss. And that is because if you're looking at uh, sort of in the through slice direction, if we have a gradient in the magnetic field there, that means spins on one side of the uh, slice will have maybe gotten a little bit ahead, and uh, spins that are at the opposite side of the slice will have gotten further behind, and they sort of dephase, and the net sum of all of these spins will be less signal. And at one point, they will be completely gone. So here's an example of that uh, from what's happening in the frontal lobe due to that air tissue interface in the sinuses. And you can see that as we get lower down in the brain, you really lose a lot uh, in signal. So what can we do about this? Well, um, one very simple solution would just be to make the slice thinner. If we have a thinner slice, there's less phase variation across that slice and we have less signal loss. Of course, the drawback for that is that we need more slices to cover the entire brain, uh, which leads to longer acquisition times. There are some additional techniques uh, such as Z-shimming that have been developed, but to my knowledge, they're not very commonly used uh, as of yet. Another artifact is called Nyquist ghosting. Here's some examples of that. And that is uh, particularly seen here in this image of the phantom. And that is that in addition to the main image, we see this ghost or this additional image sort of displaced by half of the field of view. You can kind of make that out here uh, in this image, uh, sagittal image of a person's brain. The reason for this error is due to errors in the timing between the acquisition and the gradients. That is, we think we want to acquire the data at these green points, and we think that's what we're doing, but actually there's a little bit of a timing error. Uh, and that is then we are acquiring the data a bit too late. Maybe we started our analog to digital converter a little bit too late. Uh, and that means that all the signals will be shifted to the right here for this line, to the left for this line, to the right, and so on. And so that causes an intensity variation that is sort of alternating every other line in K space. So we have increased signal here, decrease, increase, decrease, and so on. And so this essentially is the highest possible frequency you could represent in K space, which is equivalent to the furthest position in real space. So what that means is that a voxel that should be in the center or signal that should be in the center actually appears suddenly at the edge of this image. So that's what causes this Nyquist ghost. So ways we could fix that, one is we can try to adjust our gradients and our timing to make sure our timing is as accurate as possible. One other technique that is done is using what's called a reference scan. That is, we can scan the K-space lines twice, alternate directions, and then compare those two lines. Now this could be done either as a separate scan, which is actually quite common. So if you're acquiring the data on the GE scanners for an EPI sequence, uh, you'll actually hear as part of the pre-scan a, a, a separate reference scan that's acquired. Another technique uh, would be to essentially remove the center blip here. And what that does is that when you're scanning through K-space, once you get to the center of K-space, you scan it once in one direction and then again in the opposite direction and then you continue on. So we've acquired the center of line, center of K-space where most of the signal is, we've acquired that twice and we can compare both of those directions and shift them back and forth to get the optimal, uh, find out any what the timing errors might be. Motion is perhaps the most common type of artifact that we encounter in MRI. 
On the left, you can see an example of what some pretty severe motion looks like in a typical structural image, and it has this very characteristic kind of ringing pattern to it. For functional MRI, one characteristic sign of movement artifact, in this case, if we're looking at the activation, is if we see positive activation on one side, or that is positive signal changes on one side and negative signal changes at the opposite side, because if movement occurs, then we're gonna see the signal changes particularly prominent at the edges. So for example, a voxel that is outside the brain is suddenly now inside the brain and at the opposite end, one that was inside the brain is now outside the brain, so we see the opposite signal change. As I said, it could be a little bit more subtle than this. Uh, here's actually looking at just the time course from one voxel within an fMRI time series. And you can see this sudden jump at a you know, time point beginning here and then perhaps another jump later on here. Now this is about a 10% or so signal change, which is generally much larger than what we would expect to see from uh, just brain activation and generally more rapid as well. So I show this slide really to emphasize uh, for all of you researchers to really look at your data and look at it closely, not just at the images, but also at the time courses, because these are some things that are really difficult to see just by looking at the images themselves, but you can spot them pretty quickly just looking at the time courses. So what can we do about motion artifacts? Well, first step ideally is to prevent the movement from occurring. Uh, we can do that by putting in more padding, like foam padding. We can use other kinds of mobilization devices, such as a vacuum pillow, or a bite bar, that is we can have the person biting down on something, which is actually a very efficient, very good way of, of restricting head movement. Uh, but unfortunately, it uh, is not very comfortable for the participant, and so that's why it's not really widely used. The next step we could do is to detect and then discard the data if it's corrupted by motion. And all of the scanners that we're using here for research um, are set up to do real-time uh, monitoring of the movement, either using AFNI or FIRM or some other software. So you can, using the software, you can detect if movement occurred and then decide on the fly, was that movement too much? Do we need to stop and reacquire the data? Um, what is the quality of the data while the participant is still in the scan? Prospect of motion correction, I'm gonna go into in the next few slides. Beyond that, we can also try to do some uh, corrections in post-processing, such as rigid body registration or other kinds of alignments. So one of the challenges with movement, and a particular challenging for certain post-processing corrections, is that the movement is three-dimensional. Uh, and so if we acquire a set of slices, like you've seen here, well, if the person moved partway through, the slices might actually be acquired like this, so they don't perfectly stack together. So one solution would be to try to track the movement using some techniques at a more rapid time scale, and then being able to register the slices within the volume. There are some techniques developed to do that. But the other is to do what's called prospective motion correction. And that is, we have some additional pulses or measurements, perhaps external measures, to detect when a movement occurs. Then we can feed that information back to the MRI scanner and have it actually update the slice position and have the slice track with the movement. This is actually a technique that's been around for quite some time, or the idea has been around for quite some time, uh, been developed in the late 1990s. But I think implementing it uh, and having it work correctly is still a bit of a challenge, particularly for functional MRI. But for structural imaging, there are now sequences that are available from the scanner manufacturers. Here's an example that's from GE, what they call their prospect of motion correction or PROMO. Uh, and you can see the differences without and with PROMO while a person was moving their head. We can still get some clear images. Another challenge with head movement is that if you move your head, it actually changes the magnetic field a little bit. Uh, and so we have to account for that if we wanted to do a really good job and perfect kind of corrections. And finally, another challenge uh, with head movement is that the brain is not a perfectly rigid body. Here's an example of just the movement of the brain, sort of amplified and accentuated a bit, but just the movement uh, closer to the base of the brain uh, with the heartbeat or the pulse tone movement. And you can see that the brain actually moves around uh, quite a bit, maybe on the order of a millimeter or so as you get to the bottom of the brain. Other artifacts uh, that you might encounter, uh, if you see something like this when you're acquiring the data, uh, what's going on? You see this weird kind of shading uh, at a very kind of low spatial frequency. Well, this is due to RF overranging. That is, if you've turned up the receiver's gain too much, 
then uh, the signal is so high that your um, analog to digital converter doesn't have enough bandwidth uh, to uh, enough dynamic range, I should say, uh, to digitize that signal. Uh, and so what happens is that the center of case space, that where you have the brightest signal, gets clipped off. And a center of case space is where you have the lowest frequency information. And so what you're essentially doing is you're throwing away or you're missing that low frequency information. And that causes this very sort of gross shading artifact. So the solution, if you see something like this, is to just adjust in your pre-scan and reduce the receiver gains, which uh, on the GE scanner I'll call the R1 and R2. Another kind of artifact you might encounter on uh, some structural images would be uh, these sort of zipper-like artifacts, this bright signal intensity, a streak sort of going through the image. And this is indicative of some sort of extra radio frequencies coming in or leaking into your image. Uh, this could be caused by having the door to the scan room being open. And as you might know, the scan room itself is actually shielded on all sides uh, with metal to build a perfect Faraday cage around it so that any outside radio frequencies don't come in and cause interference. Um, now, if you kept the door open, then you might get other uh, radio frequency interference to come into the scanner room. It's also possible that maybe you've brought some devices, uh, electronic devices, into the scanner room, perhaps to show stimuli to the subjects or so. And if these are not properly shielded, uh, they can also cause radio frequency uh, signals to emit. Uh, and finally, it could also be just that the shielding around the scanner room has deteriorated and gone bad. So that's important to note. Another uh, potential problem with RFs is it causes spikes. So here's an example of what we saw in some of our images. And this is actually really difficult to spot just looking at the images themselves. But if you look at the time series, so what you've seen here are uh, a three by three pixels uh, showing the time course for each of these uh, nine pixels. And you can see this big jump in the signal intensity. And this was actually due to a loose connection in the RF coil. Now this we might be able to fix just by throwing out those few frames. Um, you know, in this case, uh, we saw the spiking much more frequently. Again, there may be periods that we just can throw out and ignore and still use the remaining data, but sometimes it can just be very severe and there's really no way to salvage this data. So another sort of plug for really monitoring your data in real time uh, to see what the data quality is. And finally, uh, just getting into some physiological fluctuations. Uh, and this is particularly, I'm showing you here how relevant it is for functional MRI data. If we look at a time series of echoplanar images, um, you might see some fluctuations, particularly lower down on the brain, around the circle of Willis, uh, around basically pulsatile arteries, you would see these uh, large fluctuations. Now, uh, even if you're not imaging fast enough to actually see things at the cardiac frequencies at about one hertz, uh, if you acquire, let's say, the data every two seconds, you're still going to see these fluctuations. They're just going to be aliased to different frequencies. And finally, respiration-related changes. Um, generally, what happens is that the uh, chest wall moving uh, causes changes in the magnetic field. And this change in the magnetic field can actually shift the image very subtly in the phase encoding direction. So here's actually a measurement of that uh, from a colleague of mine, Yashi Potorka. Uh, and you can see you know, very nice periodic fluctuations in the magnetic field, and that causes changes in the MRI signal due to this very subtle movement. How can we correct for that? Well, one very common correction out there is what's called retro i core stands for retrospective image correction. And the idea is that if you have actually measured the person's heartbeat and breathing, uh, then you could calculate for every image the phase of the cardiac cycle and the phase of the respiratory cycle that that image was acquired in. And then you can create sines and cosines of those phases and then remove those or regress those out of the data. Essentially, what that is equivalent to is that it's taking your data and reshuffle it according to, say, the cardiac respiratory phase. Let's say here we've reshuffled it according to the cardiac phase. Uh, and then we even fit a lower order sine and cosine to this fluctuation and then remove that from the data. So these are just some examples of some artifacts that you might encounter, particularly for neuroimaging and particularly for functional MRI. I hope I've given you some uh, insights uh, into what you might be able to do if you encounter these.